So she's the wife of the most honorable prime minister. Our Louise Benny Coverley, 
our Shelly and Fraser Price. Jamaica, phenomenal place. You could not believe that we have such greatness coming out of the island of Jamaica. So, here go some of the technicalities. We do come from a very geographically special location, us in Jamaica. In the path of the trade winds between the western coast of Southern Africa and the eastern coast of North America, there lies the resultant economic, environmental, cultural, political consequence of why as Jamaicans, we have been taught to be very balanced as a people. We have learned to be fierce, yet gentle. We have learned to be strident, yet flexible. We have learned to be skeptical, but we are welcoming. And there is a reason why I am going to engage you in balance. It's a women's uh, recognition of Women's Month. We just did some celebrations of International Women's Day, but I'm gonna take this presentation from a very different place, one of balance. And you're gonna see why, yes. Now, I will tell you that the balance that we have always brought, coming out of a little country like Jamaica, to global discourse on matters such as trade, geopolitics, academia, sports, cultural exchange, gastronomy, and our absolute fabulous fashion, is one of the balance. All of these are culminated in what Jamaicans call, and I hope some of you know what I mean when I say, one hand can't clap. <laughs> the concept of balance and partnership embodied in the phrase, one hand can't clap, will inform my approach to this presentation today. I have lost the mic, but guess what? I'm a politician, I have a loud mouth. Oh, it's back, <laughs> all right. <laughs> So it has and will inform this presentation. And I guess what? It actually informs a lot about who I am as an individual in my own approach to business, my own personal life, and to the politics balance. It is therefore my pleasure to be here from international women of influence all the experiences that you have had here today to enhance your own awareness, my own awareness, and create a more understanding and inform individuals on the issues and our own approach to women's empowerment. We learn from each other, North and South. And my geography was very bad, so I'll soon explain that one to you. Developed and developing countries, male or female, black or white, yes, we learn from each other. Let me therefore use this opportunity to underscore the fact that the success of this conference is tied to all our collective perspective all our collective drive to advance the cause of our respective constituents, I'll call it, because, yes, different constituencies, regardless of our geographic, regardless of our political, racial, or our economic situation. But of course, we start the discourse on a focus on women. Us. Because when women do well, the family does well. The community does well. Yes, when women do well, the world is a better place in which to live. So you understand when I say, one hand can't clap. If it is only me.
men who are excelling and earning and leading and innovating, the society is invariably repaid only half of its potential benefits. Yes. Me and this man. One hand. <laughs> so that is why we gather not only to celebrate our international women of influence, but also to reinforce the fact that the world has become a better place by inclusion. Inclusion of more women in leadership, more women in business, that's us, more women in innovation. We gather to underscore that we, when we increase gender equity, we increase our global chances of sustainable development. We help to reduce hunger. We help to reduce poverty. We make this world a far more civilized place in which to live. Yes. It was about 28 years ago that they had the fourth world staging of a conference in Beijing. If you remember at the time, international community met and they agreed on a blueprint in terms of what were we going to do to advance women's rights. That's where those buzz started to come from, gender equality, and they came up with 12 key areas. For me, some of the very critical areas were education, health, violence against women, and very critically for us, economic empowerment. The vision at the time and the goals was to continue to inspire women's rights. And literally, it developed a lot of women's rights activists. A lot of persons in academia were very much now on the ball. And people interested in sustainable development as practitioners were right on the money. Everyone was involved in crafting and taking responsibility to have policies and legislations related now to gender equity. So in Jamaica, yes, we may small, but for us and the rest of the Caribbean, we happily embrace the principles of gender equity. And certainly, it has become noteworthy, some of our achievements. The Caribbean story, Jamaican story, need to be told, and I'm here to tell you. The identity that I have as a Caribbean woman with a distinctly Jamaican orientation gives me a particular perspective because the Caribbean experience is born out of our region's history of colonialism, slavery, and economic dependence over the years. It has actually impacted how we deal with contemporary areas that concerns women's rights. Our perspective is a little different. Therefore, while I expound on the theme, international women of influence, my presentation is going to take a little bit of a Caribbean flavor and stance. So how did the Caribbean gender equity framework create women of influence who are now impacting the globe? How has our gender equity success of the global south propel or enhance the visibility of minority women. What are some of the successful Caribbean practices that aided the development of more inclusive mechanisms for gender equality in the global south? And finally, what are some current challenges that deter the sustenance of gender equity gain 
for women in the global south. So you hear me telling you about geography? I know it's going to come. Caribbean gender equity framework, which facilitates various policies and initiatives, are and have always been aimed at promoting gender equity and has actually played a significant role in highlighting women of influence in our region. These women of influence have literally gone on to impact the globe in various ways. We have done exceedingly well in politics, business, academia, innovation. One key aspect of the Caribbean gender equality framework is increased women's participation, particularly in the decision-making process. That is where it is at, helping to be at the decision table. It has literally given rise to increased number of women in leadership roles, including government. In Jamaica, when you look back in 1944, one single female representative was in parliament, just one. And up until recently, we didn't know what it would be like to ever have a female prime minister. Across the Caribbean region, not significantly different. So it sort of filled my heart with immense joy when I realized my own parliament in Jamaica started something different. We, for the very first time in our history, had an all young female parliamentary session. Wow. Young women, yes, 18 wow. to 25. represented by young, bold, active, wow. innovative wow. women who would be leaders of Jamaica tomorrow. I felt it was my responsibility to nurture this uh, boldness in our young women, and it was phenomenal. So we are committed. Guess what? It won't be a one-year affair. Every year going forward, we will continue to promote an all-female parliament so that those projects sustain in the minds of persons that as women, we can do it. You know, I think I'm just gonna pop down. <laughs> so I will tell you, the Caribbean has actually benefited. We have benefited as we have taken the portion to ensure that we are doing more in leadership and in government. Now, our statistics may not mean a lot, but it still means something to us. I looked at somewhere like Grenada. I'm not going to ask if anybody's here from Grenada. It is one of the smaller islands in the Caribbean. But guess what? It had 33% of its women in parliament from as far back as 2019. And when you did a comparison to our wonderful US of A, we had only 23.7% here. So little, little Grenada was outstepping in terms of the women that they had in parliament vis-a-vis -vis our big, powerful, mighty United States. And guess what? It was not by accident, no. Caribbean countries have been implementing several measures to increase women's political participation. Some have actually even gone into quota systems. Now, I have encouraged my own political party that the seats that are easy breezy to win, give them to the women. So that we can have the flexibility as women to be able to participate as ministers. So we still have that sort of matriarchal society where the seats that you don't have to even campaign in and on the night of election when the bell rings and they're starting to call out who has won, most of those seats are still going to the men. It makes it easier for them to function as ministers because they don't have to worry about a constituency. I can tell you, like most of the females, I have a constituency, I have to work. 
Jamaicans would say you have to walk hard. And that is what happens to most of us as women. So we in Jamaica have gone even further. We recognize something else. We literally started something very innovative for us. A political caucus of women, we only have two parties, two political parties, of every single woman in parliament, regardless of the political party you were from. Why we did this? Because we realized that despite our differences as politicians, what united us as women is a drive to make life better, opportunities better, ensure equality and equity for all the women of Jamaica. So today, the women of not just Jamaica, I'll tell you, significantly other areas in the Caribbean are benefiting from something we established in our little island. We established a Jamaica Women's Political Caucus and we have literally gone into other areas of the Caribbean to give some amount of training and help in providing some assistance for persons in politics, in theology, in business, and we have seen it working. So, indeed, one nation, little nation, helping other nations as we grow together and become stronger in the fight to ensure women have equity. Once again, I tell you, it means one hand can't clap. One country helping another. Permit me to use my own personal experience. I have a pride that I stand here not just as the wife of the Prime Minister of Jamaica. I have the, I, I literally, I must tell you, I am profoundly happy to be in the position of being his wife. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Proud of the title. But guess what? I am also twice returned as a member of parliament in the House of Representatives. I am Deputy Speaker of the House, and for the first time in our history, we have a female Speaker of the House, a female Deputy Speaker of the House, and a female leader in the Senate as a leader of government business. I believe that we are poised to change history. And we continue to do so because for the first time in Jamaica's history, we have finally achieved 28.5% and we believe it's a big achievement. 28.5% of our parliament, finally women. And this is coming from 1%. It's a big thing for us to be in a position that we are able to see more women coming into the role of making decisions. And guess what? We didn't do it by a quota system. It was very deliberate. I'm proud of my prime minister because he saw the need to put in place something called a gender ministry, gender, culture, and sports is the name of the ministry, and it is headed by a female, all right? I'm sure we are going to have some good male gender experts in the ministry going forward, but we have decided we're gonna take that lead as women in establishing the work of the gender ministry. And I will tell you that the gender ministry has been very active since 2011. It has been active in terms of looking back at legislations. It has been active in being able to set up the review of laws that dealt with things as serious 
as our domestic violence situation in Jamaica? Yes. I would like to segue a little to what we are doing on one other key area, and that's education. And I think it's probably the case in the US here too. I started to look at what was happening in Jamaica and what was happening in the rest of the Caribbean as it relates to women. And guess what? I noticed a trend. In all the universities, whether it be Mona Campus where I was, St. Augustine or Cave Hill, right across the Caribbean, it was approximately now 60% of women enrolling in the universities or graduating from universities to anywhere between about 37%. So I remember checking um, Cavill campus, 33% of the graduates were male, 33. 67% females, graduates at top-notch university. Same thing for our university in Jamaica. It was 59.4%, almost 60% to 40. And when we looked at St. Augustine, it was the same. It was 63% to 37%. So guess what? Women are benefiting from some of these policies because education is one of the tools that will drive the success of women and empower them right across the Caribbean. So looking at this room, and listening to some of the stories, it reminds me that for us as Caribbean women who have had to seek other opportunities, we have had to migrate because guess what? We want to be able to earn more. We have had to be able to migrate because opportunities over the years afforded to us in the great United States is just not available in Trinidad or Jamaica or Barbados or Bermuda. So many of us have come here and have set up here and have done very well. We have gained financial independence, economic independence, personal development as women coming into countries like the US. However, we have not only gained these personal academies, we have contributed significantly. Look at you phenomenal ladies who have come as migrants from the Caribbean. Many come right here and contribute and do so in a very big way. I'm reminded of your own vice president whose father is from my hometown in Jamaica, right from Jamaica, and we have had many others. Louis Farrakhan, his family was connected to the Caribbean, Malcolm X to the Caribbean, and so many, many more. So when I think about one hand, can clap, it means that for us who have gotten our education, need to seek more opportunities, we have literally been able to come and give to a country other than our country of birth our skills, our talent, our expertise to build another country and still as persons in the diaspora here, you have never forgotten home. And so we have to big up those in the diaspora. You have never forgotten home. So when I spoke of geography in terms of my one hand can clap on where we're from, can anybody yet tell me where those of us from Jamaica, from Africa, from Trinidad, from Asia, are we from the north or from the south? Guyana, are we from the north or from the south? The south. So you knew we were from the South when we spoke about our struggles and how little we had, absolutely. And many of us have migrated to the North. But guess what? Still one family in our one and can clap because we continue to contribute wherever we are planted. So for us in Jamaica,
Jamaica, our women have been feminist activists, I call it. We have an activist movement in seeking to challenge and to transform what were some of our patriarchal norms and our patriarchal practices. Our women in minority communities and becoming minority here in what is the global north have been able to infuse themselves in a way that they are contributing also to your communities here, contributing to activism here, contributing to improving immigration laws, contributing to ensure that though they are from a little place like the Caribbean, they are Talawa, like us as Jamaicans, contributing in a very infectious way to ensuring that they do better as minority women here in the North. I won't get into some of the information age, you see I'm going through some of it. So for us, one of the other key motivating and developing factor for us, other than our health, our education, I'll tell you, is how do we finance and help our businesses? And this was special for us in Jamaica. When we looked at small businesses, when we looked at female-headed businesses, we had lots. And we made a conscious decision as a country that we were going to put in place facilities that supported women. So when you looked in 2010 at companies that finance female-headed businesses, and you looked at the loan portfolio, you would guess how much of it, the entire loan portfolio had more than 70% of the loans going to business women. That was phenomenal for us. These microfinance institutions supported our women. So we took it a step further as government. I don't know what happens here in the States, but the government also ensured that it took an approach of women's entrepreneurship support. They started to give grants to women, loans to women, and business development services to female entrepreneurs. We worked on ensuring that they were on the cusp of cutting edge technology. And it has made a phenomenal difference. Because if you know places like Jamaica, Hill and Gully, hills and valleys, <laughs> it means for those who are very, very rural, they are now with technology able to access the information. Even if they don't have the mobility, they can jump online and apply for their small business loan and improve their situation right there in their rural spaces. So I do believe coming from the global south, we have in fact made some contributions. We have in fact been able to establish what we believe are some best practices that even countries like yours in the global north can look at as an example, say, okay, what do we not have here? What could we learn? And as I said, I'm equally here to learn. I don't want to keep you here too long, so I'm moving ahead. I would tell you that though we are doing some things good, um, I would say it is not foolproof. We do also have some threats. It is not all rosy. We do also have some challenges, particularly to ensuring that we are able to sustain the gains that we have made in Jamaica and undoubtedly 
in other places in the Caribbean. There are places where girls still face significant barriers to accessing education. Once you have struggles accessing education, then it limits your opportunity for economic empowerment. And we do still have those serious issues. I have always wondered as well and asked myself, though we are outstripping at this current time, men, in terms of our ability to access education in some areas across the Caribbean, does our education necessarily mean that it is offering us the structural change that it's supposed to do? structural change in its entirety. So what I mean here is, yes, we may be more educated. 60% women, 40% men. But where do we go to work after we're educated? Are we taking up the jobs in mathematics, science, engineering? Are we in technology? Are we in innovation? Or are we, as I observe, many of us still teach us and I appreciate my teachers, yeah. but very often, all women in the classroom. Yes. The men don't want to go, they're not paid enough. Yes. Again, all women, social workers. Yes. Majority. Majority. Because yes. of nurturing, it's not for the money. Yes. All women in the jobs that are in the food industry, for the most part in service industry for the most part? Are we, even though educated, accessing some of these jobs that were predominantly jobs for the boys? So for me, it's still a challenge. We are the nurses. Many of them, they are the doctors. <laughs> that is the fact. So, I believe, as women, we still have to look at that. It is a barrier. When one female breaks that glass ceiling, what it does for others is to say, I can do it too. If you have done it, then it can't be that hard. It means I can do it too. And that has to be our approach. So guess what? When you are the first woman to embark on anything, anywhere, and you realize that you're the first, you better do it. <laughs> you better do it. Yes. Why? Because your sisters are depending on you. Another of the problems we have in the global south, it was low paying jobs. Low paying jobs, that's where the women are. So if you come to Jamaica, probably 10 years ago, and you stopped at a service station, men pump the gas. When I go to a service station now, I'm saying, where are the men? All women pumping the gas, sweeping up the service station. When I ask, what's your salary? Minimum wage. Minimum wage. So our housekeepers, minimum wage. Security guards, minimum wage. Those pumping at the service station, minimum wage. And more and more and more, what you're seeing is that because women are the nurturers and we have our families to take care of, we can't afford not to feed our children. So even if the job is low paying, we are going to do it, and we're going to fight, and we're going to battle through. So that, for me, remains a serious hindrance going forward. One of the challenges we still have to look at. The other problem that we continue to have, despite our new laws, despite us having enacting some serious sexual harassment laws, even in Jamaica. So when you watch television, you look at the US, if you look at your female counterpart too hard, don't look at her too hard. Yeah. 
you could be accused of sexual harassment. But in the Caribbean, it was never a problem to see a girl passing and you slap her butt or you touched her on the hair and say, you look sexy, girl. No issue at all because no one saw that as sexual harassment. So we are literally getting our society to that place. We are. However, I would want to encourage that we did one thing more. In our agenda of Bureau Affairs, guess what we did? We said we want the men to also come in. The men to also come to the male desk. The men to be trained and be included in appreciating what it meant to sexually harass or to be in a situation of gender-based violence. And though it was sometimes very contentious for some of the men, even in Parliament when we went through the bill, some of the men didn't appreciate what they were hearing because sexual harassment now was a very serious thing. But it is so important to have their inclusion in being able to eliminate gender-based violence because men have to be engaged in that partnership of one hand can't clap. We cannot do that alone. Last but not least was another stark reality that came to me in the COVID pandemic, and I'm sure it happened here as well. During the COVID pandemic, all of a sudden, we realize that when we have some catastrophes, women are the ones who get sacrificed. So in Jamaica, when COVID came, the women were home taking care of the children because the schools closed and the men were out at work. The women were told, take care of your mother-in-law and your father-in-law. They are sick. You need to stay home and take care of them. And I'm sure it didn't only happen in the Caribbean or in Jamaica. It happened right across the world. Many women had to take a step back from career. And even if they didn't need to take a step back, guess what? Many women were in careers that were considered dispensable. So if I couldn't work, I can't pay my housekeeper. So my housekeeper is now home without a job because I'm taking care of my kids. My housekeeper now is trying to figure out where am I getting food? Where am I going to be able to put some food on the table, put clothes on my kids back. How am I going to manage? I can't pay my rent. And we saw that in Jamaica impacting primarily women. Now what makes it hard, and I'm not sure about your statistics here, in Jamaica, most of our households are female-headed households. So when our women are targeted in that way, because of the type of professions we have, because of still the sense that you're the nurturer and the caregiver, the sense that you are the one who should stay home instead. If you don't get very creative, your family suffers and you are set back for a long, long time to come. We are the ones who are in these temporary and part-time jobs. What does that mean? If you get sick, you still go to work because you're not getting any pay. You don't have any sick days. That is what happens. Many of these women do not have paid leave. When you take time off, you're a day's worker. You didn't work today, you don't get paid for today. Well, it happens a lot in the States where you get paid by the hour, if you don't turn up, you don't get paid. But for Jamaica, for the most part, most persons work and earn for the month. The people who are often in these part-time jobs, still no pay, no health insurance, no health benefit, no sick leave, no vacation pay, no time off, are the women. So for me, these continue to be some of the areas, though we have done very well, 
though we have achieved a lot, that are still of areas, still areas of great concern. I hope that coming out of our time and our sessions here today and all the engagement that you have had in listening to women discuss issues, possibly solutions, what their history is, what their circumstances are, having an appreciation of where women really fit currently in the world, where we're coming from, and we're still yet to go, we will all leave this conference empowered to do far more, realizing that we carry our sisters on our back. When we take a step up, we must drag our sisters up with us. If they are not feeling like they want to get up and move, strong sisters, you pull them. Because they are going to understand. If it means you're on the ladder and you have to bend down, hold on, grab them and pull them up. Because when you look at the economic opportunity, to improve what is considered to be the gross domestic product, GDP, the growth, the economy of all the economies in the world. When women are doing well, guess what? Not just women do well. The entire family does well, or men do well, and we all do well. My hope is that today's presentation will trigger a discussion on how we can effectively provide that balance in the discourse around gender equity and be more effective in achieving a greater sense of equality as a people because the developmental gains are critical. I know that we have made progress, but as you can see, we still have hurdles to cross to fully be effective in this regard. So for me, the theme of this year's conference is no coincidence. Yes, it isn't. If we are going to inspire women to become international women of influence, we must be intentional about it. We must really assess the current state of development in order to assist our women to identify the various entry points into that development arena. So the idea that women belong at the table in democratic government, only those we can talk about, is absolutely essential as a measuring stick of any modern functional society. I wholeheartedly believe that development for us in the Caribbean, the global south, has to be more inclusive. Inclusive enough to understand that empowerment looks differently in different spaces and even women who think we are disempowered have the power to negotiate the terms of our empowerment. Yes, we do. I likewise wholeheartedly that our assessment of development of women needs to move from stressing on quantitative figures, but also instead have a methodology that aims to understand the various qualitative nuances within gender equity. 
There are also many areas about gender equality that has become fact over time. But some of our grassroots women will tell you that some of these thinking not so correct. So ladies and gentlemen, the future is bright. Yes, it is. I have one parting message. And men, I said one hand can't clap because though today is about us, <laughs> okay? Today is about the women. We will never forget or minimize the importance, the role that men play in supporting us as women, in believing in us. We do not forget for a moment. And that's why we know one hand can't clap. But I have a special message for my sisters. You are powerful, inspiring, and capable of making a difference in the world. Your accomplishments and achievements are testament to your strength, perseverance, and dedication. You have overcome obstacles, shattered glass ceilings, and paved the way for future generations of women to follow in your footsteps. Your influence, women, your influence is going to be phenomenal for years to come. It must be felt through your community. It must be felt across borders and oceans. Your voice, your voice, women, it carries weight and your actions have the power to inspire and ignite change on a global scale. You are the embodiment of what it means to be a trailblazer, a leader, a role model. Never forget the impact you have and already have made and the potential that you still hold to do more. Continue to be the voice of those who are silenced a champion to those who are marginalized and a mentor for those who are just starting on their own journey of influence. Your work is not done and the world is waiting for the next chapter of your story. Yes. I love it.